Bhopal, Central India, 1984. <laughs> City residents wake, choking and unable to breathe. Stampeding in panic, thousands die. Poisoned by the very air around them. An American-owned factory, supposedly rigged with safety systems, triggers the world's deadliest industrial accident. Disasters don't just happen. They're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Bhopal, India. December 3rd, 1984. Five past midnight. And at the Union Carbide Pesticide Plant, workers detect a minor gas leak and phone it in. Control room operator Suman Day is the first point of contact. Yes. There is a leak. So immediately I check it out. Suman leaves the control room to search for the leak. He heads over to the storage area where the plant's most volatile chemicals are kept buried under a thick layer of concrete. Alongside phosgene, used as a chemical weapon during World War I, is a massive volume of MIC, methyl isocyanate, the main ingredient of seven, the pesticide the plant produces. It's one of the world's most toxic chemicals. A huge amount of MIC has been kept there. All the chemicals are equally dangerous. Everybody has to be very cautious if anything goes wrong. The distinctive smell of gas tells Suman the leak is close by. <coughs> it was leaking, but thing is, that was leaking slowly, slowly. Minor gas leaks are a regular occurrence, and the workers have had to learn to live with the choking effects. <laughs> Everything was all right. I have checked all the pressure, temperature, and all that. Then I said there was no work for us. So we were just chatting with other fellow in the control room. <laughs> plant workers call again. At the 15-year-old plant, inaccurate meter readings are common, so Suman takes another look at the pressure gauge. I found that the needle is zero to zero. In minutes, the pressure in the chemical storage tanks has shot off a scale. 12.20, Suman Day rushes to the storage area where it's immediately clear that something is very wrong. This area was very hot. It is trembling. The concrete is vibrating. Suman sprints for the control room. Gas escapes into the factory's maze of pipes. There was a big, huge hissing sound, like a steam engine, you know. 12.30. Suman implements emergency procedures to neutralize the gas as it passes through a cleaning column called the bent gas scrubber. But nothing happens. Then the gas passes through the flare tower, designed to burn off any escaping gas. No, it's not working. But again, nothing. Under huge pressure, the gas hurtles through the network of pipes, up a venting chimney, and out into the atmosphere. I understand this is a big, big disaster. Operators are powerless to stop toxic gas pumping into the night sky.
I announced that there is a big leakage from the storage area. Please evacuate. For a couple of minutes, we were really uh, spellbound what to do. Never did it, it has come to anybody's mind that this type of disaster can happen. It's not just plant workers at risk. 1 a.m. The Union Carbide plant is right next to the residential heart of Bhopal. And a southeasterly wind blows the toxic cloud straight towards its half a million inhabitants. Not far from the factory, plant worker T.R. Chuhan has the weekend off. I was happy because my daughter was very small and I was thinking that there's no headache of night shift. But in the dead of night, he's suddenly woken. My son was weeping. At the same time, we felt some irritation in our eyes. You give him some water to drink. I'll go and see. As the gas cloud condenses, it sinks to ground level, cloaking the sleeping city in a poisonous blanket. Almost immediately, empty streets fill with residents, gasping for breath in terrified confusion. The street was full of the people just running, just running. So I immediately decided that I have to also run my children with my family. <laughs> They are vomiting, coughing. He saw the people dying, running, they are falling and dying. Meanwhile, at the factory, safety systems that neutralize or burn the gas still aren't working. And the factory's final barrier to all out disaster is also failing. Workers have grabbed emergency water hoses to spray and dissolve the escaping gas. But the water jets aren't powerful enough to reach the gas spewing from the chimney. After half an hour, the flow of toxic gas shows no sign of slowing down. Across town, a late night phone call wakes Dr. Bandari, senior consultant at Bhopal's main hospital. Hello? No, no. Slow down, please. You just rinse their eyes and put some eye drops. I got a telephone call from the hospital. There's some gas has leaked out from a factory, which is probably ammonia. A number of patients have come here with eye problem. So I told him to put some eye drops. He told me again, the number of patients is increasing and I can't manage. So could you please come? Yes, yes. I'm coming there shortly. Alarmed by the unusual call, Dr. Bandari checks outside for any signs of gas. <coughs> I went inside. I was quite breathless and constantly coughing and coughing and coughing. With every minute, the invisible gas cloud spreads, covering an area some eight kilometers wide. Locals only know it's impossible to breathe. Tens of thousands flee their homes in a panic stampede, choking to death as they run. At the Union Carbide plant, Suman Day is safely sealed inside the control room. But with workers unaccounted for, he goes back into the factory on a rescue mission. Quickly, I got mask and I gun inside the factory once again. 
I was thinking to save all the people who are working there. But he's soon running out of air. I was so scared, I was so frightened. In that fraction of moment, I was thinking maybe it's my end. Across the city, factory worker Chu Han and his family are desperate. In the chaos, they know they must flee or perish. Then I saw an empty car. Let's go, let's go. Come, come, come. convinces the driver to help them. When I saw empty, you want to save your life, please go to the new city side. After a violent coughing fit, Dr. Bandari has recovered enough to reach the hospital. As soon as I reached the hospital, I saw a lot of people standing there waiting for the treatment. What's happening? Fast one are they're just coming and coming and coming. And what about her? Doctor, I wash your eyes with water, but it's not helping. The police have told him he's Stop. dealing with a leak of ammonia. Hold on, hold on. Bandari expects conventional treatments will solve the patient's problems. <laughs> but the symptoms are far more extreme. Many of them were having now the respiratory problem, coughing, choking sensation. His standard remedies are ineffective. We did not know it but to know. This is an unknown medical condition. Thousands of choking, dying Bhopalis overwhelm the hospital. And Bandari needs answers. He's convinced the gas isn't ammonia. You don't understand. There are hundreds of patients outside my clinic. First, the Indian said it's ammonia, then they said it's phosgene. Just tell me, what gas is this? Then they said it is MIC. We had never heard the MIC methyl isocyanate and we had no antidote or no such information from mineral carbide. Unknown to the medics, MIC is reacting with the water in victims' bodies, forcing blood to pour into the tiny spaces in the lungs, making breathing impossible. Men died instantaneously on the spot. Especially those who were running and they inhaled the gas and immediately lung becomes swollen and the people drowned in their own secretions. From three o'clock onwards we started getting a line of dead bodies. By daylight on December 3rd, the gas has dissipated across the country. But in Bhopal, some 3,000 people lie dead. And more than 300,000 are suffering the agonizing consequences of exposure to MIC. Sumande and the other plant workers survived the night. In the daylight, he sees the devastation of his city for the first time. I saw the, the buffaloes, the, the, the cows were on the street. Dead. The worst affected are the old and the young, often trapped in the densest parts of the cloud close to the ground. Within hours, Bhopal hits the headlines. The death toll in the Bhopal disaster stands at over 2,500, the worst industrial accident in history. In this area, opposite the Union Carbide site, about 10,000 people live. But this morning, the entire slum is empty. Mm -hmm. 
horror of the scale of suffering is followed by a simple question, how could this happen? The day after the disaster, the Indian government dispatches chemist Dr. Thayaga Rajan to make the plant safe. Absolutely horrifying situation. People were still on the street, dead bodies were there, and people were crying and it was panic. The Bhopal plant mass-produced seven, and company officials tell Fayaga Rajan the MIC needed was carefully stored in liquid form in tanks buried deep underground. But workers say the tank E610 was 75% full, way over the corporation's 50% recommendation. Its entire 42 tons of lethal MIC evaporated and escaped. Then Thyagarajan makes another shocking discovery. The second line of discussion with the people there was, is there any more MIC? Anywhere. That was the time we got the most devastating information. Yes, there is MIC in 611. How much? About 30, 35 tons. Oh my God as much as it went out yesterday. E610 is just one of three tanks buried in the bunker. Bhopal had massive storage capacity, but unlike other Union Carbide factories, it was only producing a few tons of seven per day. So a huge backlog of MIC was stored for weeks on end. One tank should be kept empty as a backup, but workers say that at Bhopal, all three carry the deadly chemical. Only E610 has burst, but there's no telling if the others may blow too. Thyagarajan must urgently make them safe. As Bhopal reels from the disaster, Union Carbide CEO Warren Anderson flies in from America to assess the situation. When police realize Anderson is the man ultimately responsible for the plant, they arrest him. What I'd like to do, and I hope you can help me, is tell my wife I'm alive and well and hi, Mom. But local journalists like Rajkumar Keswami think the police action is just for show. At the airport itself, he was informed that he was under arrest. But he was not taken into a lockup. He was taken to the Union Carbide guest house, which was the most beautiful place in those days in Bhopal. Hours later, Anderson is released on bail and quickly flees the country. At the pesticide factory, Dr. Thayaga Rajan must decide how to deal with the remaining 35 tons of MIC. I had no knowledge that so much quantity was being stored. In our laboratories, we keep not more than 10 milliliter. The MIC appears to be stable for now, but workers tell him that tank E610 was normal until almost the moment it erupted. We went on the basis it was also going to explode. Because as chemists, we are trained to think of the worst and then you work back. Viagarajan knows it's vital they dispose of every last drop to avoid a second disaster. But there's only one terrifying way to do it. Switch the malfunctioning factory back on. We will use the same people and produce the same carbaryl which was being produced by these people. Only 13 <coughs> days after the disaster, with thousands still dying and tens of thousands in hospital, operators are ready to try to neutralize the remaining MIC. Officials still have no idea how the first disaster happened and dub their risky new plan, Operation Faith. We only went by faith because we knew that we were competent. 
but we didn't know the quality of the material in the other tank. Therefore, we said, have faith in us. But for the people of Bhopal, restarting the factory so soon after the lethal disaster is a terrifying prospect. The people thought once the factory starts operation and the same gas which has killed several thousand people may get leaked again. There was no such guarantee. People had no fear. Even when that operation, we went on the thinking of the worst. We said that this can explode, so we had helicopters carrying water. We had covered uh, the entire plant with uh, wet canvas. Every second I was important. Bhopal 2 was a very, very strong possibility. With safety measures in place, operators restart the plant. As production begins, Bhopalis panic and flee the city. Many people left Bhopal. Nobody wanted to risk his life by taking any chance. As the remaining MIC is drained, even hospital patients join the exodus, leaving only those too sick to escape. It was a deserted city. Like a city of ghosts. It takes an agonizing seven days to turn the remaining MIC into seven pesticide. A second disaster is averted. We were happy that we could do that and we left the place uh, saying that it is now safe. The people of Bhopal return, but they're furious. Everyone wanted to know how it happened. The public, the press, journalists, the parliament. And therefore, we had to quickly conduct studies and trace the root cause of this particular disaster. Now, by rewinding the crucial events and delving deep into the investigations that followed the tragedy, we find out exactly what went wrong on that terrible night in Bhopal. Dr. Thayagarajan knows 42 tons of deadly MIC, stored safely as liquid in an underground tank, turned into a gas and escaped into the atmosphere, killing thousands. Now he must find out how. The tank area was the one which was very, very revealing. He goes straight to the storage bunker, where he finds massive cracks in the tank's concrete casing. The tank has shifted position. This is dramatic evidence of a violent chemical reaction on a huge scale. Investigators dig up the buried tank E610 to find out how the gas escaped. Despite evidence of enormous pressure, the tank itself hasn't split. Thayagarajan's team discover that the emergency pressure release valve is ruptured. The gas escaped through the emergency venting system and out into the atmosphere. It was a very clear case of runaway reaction. Something must have triggered it. Dr. Thayagarajan suspects a substance normally considered innocuous. We calculated that 500 kg of water entered the tank. Contact with water causes MIC to heat up, boil and vaporize. And that reaction is much more violent if other chemicals are added. The MIC reacts with explosive violence. The smallest impurity of any metal and water, these are deadly. Researchers find powdery residues inside the tank and send them for testing. The possibility of contaminants entering was very small there. We activated National Laboratory to repeat the reaction. 
Thyagarajan's team discovers traces of iron were left in the empty tank. It points to a clear conclusion. A huge volume of water combined with metal impurities sparked the violent and deadly reaction. Investigators now know what caused Bhopal's deadly catastrophe, but not how it happened. In a chemical plant operating state-of-the-art safety systems, this disaster should have been impossible. Union Carbide had chemical plants worldwide and was fully aware of MIC's dangerous volatility. Like every one of their factories, the Bhopal plant had safety systems to prevent any chance of contamination. We're all here to learn more about what happened in Bhopal, India. Within days of the disaster, Union Carbide boss Warren Anderson claims this was no accident. It doesn't sound like something that's inadvertent, uh, and it could be a deliberate action. With a clear implication of sabotage within the plant, trade unions representing workers seek an independent opinion. They invite American investigator Michael Wright to Bhopal, but the authorities deny him a work visa, so he must operate in secret. Neither Union Carbide nor the Indian government really wanted us there. They didn't want somebody independent mucking around in their investigation. As health and safety director for America's Steelworkers Union, his expertise is in the safe operation of large factories. Things like Bhopal are what we technically call low probability, high consequence events. These are accidents that, that happen rarely, but when they happen, they're, they're huge, they're catastrophic. With no official cooperation, Wright is forced to travel as a tourist to Bhopal. There, he witnesses the scale of the suffering firsthand. You walk through the neighborhoods and, and um, you, you realize everybody's coughing because they were exposed to this terribly toxic chemical. You meet kids who've lost their parents, parents who've lost their kids. We have to put aside the horror of what happened and figure out how it happened. You've got to look at all the possible scenarios. And a lot of accident investigation is eliminating what didn't happen. Wright isn't allowed into the plant itself, so only a covert investigation will help him discover the immediate causes of the disaster. We were able to take long-range photographs of all kinds of equipment inside the plant. We also were able to get the technical operating manual for the plant. And we talked to workers. We talked to, uh, we think, everybody who was on duty that night. Indian investigators discovered that water entered the MIC tank and triggered the fatal accident. So Wright studies factory schematics to find out where that water came from. He's immediately suspicious of a chemical processing unit right next to the MIC tanks. That process unit would sometimes clog. The way you cleared the clogs was by hooking up a water hose and blowing water through the system. That wasn't a dangerous operation. But in clandestine meetings, factory operators tell him corners had been cut. The company installed a jumper line between those two process units. A piped shortcut to the MIC storage area allowed operators to use equipment interchangeably. But it permanently linked the lethal chemical to the rest of the plant. That made the plant much more dangerous. If you had isolated that you know, IC unit completely, then water could never have gotten into it. The jumper line provided a direct route through which water could reach the MIC unit. Wright discovers that workers flushed out the pipes on the night of the disaster. A worker began that operation about 9.30 p.m. He noticed that water wasn't coming out the other end. 
Eventually water did start coming out the end and everybody thought things were fine. They were unaware that a backlog of water headed through connecting pipes towards the MIC unit. But still, a simple safety device should have blocked its progress. This metal plate, called a slip blind, slides into the junction of two pipe sections, forming a watertight seal whenever pipes are being washed. That slip blind was not there. It's what allowed water to get into the tank. Even if water did reach the MIC tanks, the plant schematics tell Wright there is one last barrier to stop it getting in. Inert nitrogen gas is pumped into the MIC tank, providing a safe high-pressure layer between the lethal liquid and the rest of the plant. It's a system Wright has seen before. It's safe and efficient, usually. But plant workers reveal faults in the system. The 30th number, I saw they are performing the press rising the six one zero, but they're not able to press rise. In a 15-year-old plant, staff were accustomed to occasional faulty readings. But plant worker Chuhan knew a total failure to pressurize the tank could only mean one thing. It means there's a leakage in vent line. Checking the factory records, Chuhan sees the problem has gone unreported for weeks. But more than 20 days, it was not holding pressure. There's no recording of pressure in the lock seat. And if a faulty valve is letting nitrogen out, it could let water in. Water took a pathway to that valve, and um, that valve would have stopped it but as the valve was leaking, we think water got through and made it into the MIC tank. It occurs to Wright that Union Carbide's claims could have weight. Maybe this was a case of sabotage. Someone could have damaged the nitrogen valve and removed the slip blind deliberately. The iron that fueled the reaction could simply be rust from the pipes. Maybe they didn't anticipate an accident of that magnitude. Union Carbide claims a disgruntled worker purposely pumped water into the MIC tanks. All we're trying to do is differentiate from an inadvertent to perhaps a deliberate. But Wright isn't ready to draw conclusions. This awful event still has secrets to be discovered. The real story of Bhopal is less how did water get in the tank and more why did none of the systems that should have protected people operate that night. The first safeguard was the vent gas scrubber. If any dangerous gas leaks, it's channeled into a large bottle-shaped tank and forced through a column of caustic soda, making it inert. When Wright meets with workers from the plant, he makes a shocking discovery. The workers said that they didn't see any, any instrumentation that indicated it was operating. The vent gas scrubber, the first of three critical lines of defense, was out of action. Wright switches attention to the other safety features. MIC is highly flammable, and a flare tower sits ready to burn off any MIC gas that hasn't been neutralized. But he finds it wasn't working either. They had taken a piece of corroded pipe, about a four-foot section, out of it, had never gotten around to replacing it. Had that been operating, it would have completely eliminated the release. With two systems down, there was one last mechanism to protect the people of Bhopal from the MIC gas. Hoses are positioned around the emergency vent stack, and workers are trained to spray water into any remaining gas as it leaves the chimney. MIC dissolves in water, so the gas should drop to the ground.
Wright cannot believe what he hears from witnesses. The problem with the water spray system is that it was undersized and the water sprays didn't reach the height of the release. Not only did water bypass protective measures and trigger the MIC reaction, but the three fundamental safety systems designed to contain an escape of gas either couldn't cope or weren't working. It's a mind-boggling sequence of failures that points to a pattern of negligence. Michael Wright begins investigating plant management and the parent company's corporate dealings. The plant was losing money. They had undergone an expansion several years earlier. They had misjudged their market. They weren't selling nearly as much pesticide as they expected to. In that kind of situation, there's always pressure from the parent corporation to cut costs. Workers tell Wright that as the emphasis on safety slackened, small leaks became commonplace and sometimes deadly. There were at least five chemical accidents in the plant between 1981 and 1984. There was a leak in December of 81 that injured three workers, one of whom died. So there were plenty of warnings that something was, was amiss. The cost cutting began with a missing slip blind. That slip line was critical to the accident. Had that been there, there never would have been an accident. To Wright's amazement, this critical piece of safety equipment was left out time and again because of staff cutbacks. The maintenance supervisor who should have been responsible had been laid off. Faulty gauges meant no one noticed when the reaction started. Throughout the plant, the instruments were out of calibration because it saved money not to do the maintenance. The vent gas scrubber wasn't working. But even if it had been, it could never have cleaned such a large amount of deadly MIC. The vent gas scrubber was only capable of dealing with puffs from valve openings. Nobody thought to design it for a big accident, and nobody wanted to spend the money. For two months, failure to replace a broken pipe meant the flare tower couldn't burn any escaping gas. Maintenance workers said it would have taken about two hours to put a new piece of pipe back in. And Union Carbide US had told their Indian counterparts that their emergency water hoses weren't up to the job. Union Carbide had said install bigger water spray systems. They hadn't done it. Wright now suspects Warren Anderson's sabotage theory is nothing but a smokescreen. Union Carbide never really presented any credible evidence. The sabotage theory was clearly Union Carbide trying to cover its tracks. Michael Wright sees an alternative explanation for the catastrophe at Bhopal. In a factory working with one of the world's most toxic chemicals, massive cost-cutting invited a massive disaster. By 1984, Union Carbide has cut the equivalent of $1.25 million from Bhopal's annual running cost. But the plant is still losing money. All the evidence points to an incredible chain of failures and negligence by Union Carbide management. A lot of things had to go wrong in Bhopal, but they all went wrong. And they all went wrong because management made fundamental decisions to save money at the expense of safety. Wright now completely discounts sabotage. This catastrophe was the company's fault. Every time we learned about a system that had been shut down and could have stopped the accident, you just shake your head because they didn't spend a little bit of money and a little bit of time. Thousands of people died. Now the investigation is complete. We can replay the exact chain of accidents and errors that overtook the Bhopal factory and killed 3,000 people on that fatal night in December 1984. Three and a half hours from disaster, a shift worker begins a routine cleaning operation, but pipes are clogged and he floods the system. Water gushes through a recently installed shortcut, straight towards giant underground storage tanks, 
full of the highly volatile pesticide ingredient MIC. Metal plates that should isolate the chemical are missing. En route to the tank, the water collects traces of iron from rust inside the aging pipes. Two hours, 15 minutes from disaster. The first drop of water seeps through a broken valve and into tank E610, containing 42 tons of liquid MIC, far more than is recommended. The water and iron mixture triggers a violent and unstoppable reaction within the MIC. With no refrigeration to keep it cool, its temperature rockets. One hour from disaster, the liquid MIC begins to boil. Workers smell gas and report it, but it's dismissed as a minor leak. As more and more liquid turns to gas, pressure soars in the tank. In the control room, faulty gauges show little change until suddenly readings shoot off the scale. Thirty-five minutes from disaster, control room operator Suman Day witnesses the runaway reaction firsthand as the spiraling pressure blows the tank's safety valve and cracks its concrete storage bunker. High pressure MIC hurtles into the vent gas scrubber. Workers expect it to neutralize escaping gas, but it's out of action. Even if it was working, it's only designed to cope with minor leaks. Tons of superheated MIC rush straight through it. 15 minutes from disaster. The toxic gas streams past the flare tower, a backup safety system that should burn off escaping gas. It's also out of action, and lethal MIC bursts into the night sky. 10 minutes from disaster. In a last ditch attempt to neutralize the escaping gas, plant workers turn on emergency water cannons. They are woefully underpowered and cannot reach the venting gas. One AM, December 3rd, 1984. A lethal cloud of MIC gas, one of the most toxic substances on earth, descends on Bhopal and its half a million residents killing 3,000 people in a matter of hours. In addition to the immediate deaths, the Indian government says a further 15,000 later died as a direct result of the disaster. To this day, more than half a million have suffered ill health from inhaling the gas or from the knock-on effects of continual pollution. People die at a rate of two and three a week, even 27 years later from the delayed effects of the, of the release. Following the disaster, Union Carbide abandoned the plant. It remains standing, a rusting hulk that casts a permanent shadow over the city of Bhopal. The factory has never been cleaned up, and groundwater studies from the site show evidence of chronic toxicity. Five years after the disaster, Union Carbide America agreed to pay a compensation package of $470 million, only around $600 per victim. As part of the deal, the corporation demanded immunity from any future criminal charges. Former CEO Warren Anderson, now in his 90s, retired to Long Island, New York. In 2010, eight former managers from Union Carbide India were convicted of death by negligence and fined $2,000 each. And to this day, the company insists the catastrophe was an act of sabotage. The people we met in Bhopal are survivors of enormous courage, enormous humanity, their story should be told and um, the, the, the loved ones who they lost should always be remembered.